So, hello everybody. Last lecture on nonlinear optics, the 30th, 13th uh, lecture. I hope uh, everybody made it to, to the lecture. For me, it was quite, quite rough this morning, actually. We got up as usual at half past five and then spent one and a half hour to get the snow out, uh, off the street because my wife wanted to go to school. She's, sorry, is something wrong? Once again. Uh, can you mute yourself? You're hearing you. Ah, yeah, okay. Sorry. So, yeah, so I had to mute the Zoom. Otherwise, those who attend also on Zoom hear me twice. That's not so good. Okay, so I was t uh, telling the story about the weather. I'm not sure whether everybody is in Jena. So you can't imagine how much snow we have. Finally, I de decided to, to come to university with my car. So you see it here. This is where I got stuck. And uh, fortunately, I brought with me a snow shovel. And so I, I cleaned up this. Uh, ah, yeah, so you don't have, you don't see what I actually wanted to show. So this is the picture I wanted to show. Yeah, so this is where I got stuck, and then I cleaned up all that, that area here because my regular parking place, no chance. Yeah? So <laughs> I was still working on the snow here, but then uh, finally I made it with the help of a few others who also got stuck. And uh, well, this is how it looked, yeah, so half a meter of snow or so. And the university didn't do anything to, to clean it up, so uh, just, uh, just amazing. Okay, anyway, um, here we are now. So those chatting on Zoom, can you please mute yourself perhaps? So otherwise I hear you twice. So we have an interesting and, uh, well, also important topic for the last lecture, and it's on solitons, and I'll give some um, extended introduction to it. Yeah, so something about the, about the history of the discovery of solitons. Yeah, so they were discovered in 1834 by John Scott Russell. I'll have a portrait of him on the next slide. And uh, their existence, so the existence of these uh, solitary waves, of these solitons, they were at odds with Newton's and Bernoulli's wave theory. And as you can imagine, um, they didn't believe him. Yeah, so John Scott Russell observed the solitons, the solitary wave, and uh, wave of translation, as he called it, uh, but nobody believed him. So, here is John Scott Russell, and um, here um, is is a yeah so is a plaque commemorating where John Scott Russell um, discovered uh, the solitary wave. So um, in Scotland um, and th I think uh, in other places in England too, they have canals um, where they were transporting. Uh, coal, for example, at these times, because this was an efficient means of uh, of transporting things before the invention of the uh, of the train. Um, and so they had these canals, um, and they actually tried to um, to arrange them such that they didn't uh, need uh, that they uh, yeah so that they went along the contour so that there were no height differences. Um, well, here the same uh, bridge here uh, with this uh, plaque. Um, and once again, the same bridge here. And what they did uh, was actually to, um, yeah, to use such ships here, such, uh, such boats, and to draw them 
with horses. Yeah, so here another view. And um, yeah, so here's a sketch that was made up by, so that was drawn by John Scott Russell. So you see such a boat, perhaps loaded with coal, and then um, here actually six horses uh, to, to tow that, um, that boat. And now the report, a report by John Scott Russell himself. Yeah? I was observing the motion of a boat which was rapidly drawn along a narrow channel by a pair of horses, not six, but a pair of horses, when the boat suddenly stopped. Not so the mass of water in the channel which it had put in motion. Yeah, so the wake. It accumulated um, around the brow of the vessel in the state of violent um, agitation, then suddenly leaving it behind, rolled forward with great velocity, assuming the form of a large solitary elevation, a rounded, smooth, and well-defined heap of water, which continued its course along the channel, apparently without change of form, so that's important, without change of form, or diminution of speed. I followed it on horseback. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and overtook it, still rolling at a rate of some eight or nine miles an hour. So that's fast. Preserving its original figure with some 30 feet long and a foot to a foot and a half in height. So 30 to, uh, 30 to 50 centimeters or so. Its height gradually diminished and after a chase of one or two miles, one or two miles, I lost it in the windings of the channel, such in the months of August 1834 was my first chance interview with that singular and beautiful phenomenon, which I have called the wave of translation. Yeah, so almost poetry, what he writes here, uh, very nice. So, and uh, I guess 150 years uh, later, there was a reenactment, and if I'm not mistaken, then uh, one of my colleagues here, um, Professor Peschel, uh, is actually in that crowd here. All right, so this was a conference, and they, they made a reenactment of the solitary wave here. So people didn't believe it, <laughs> because it didn't fit to theory. Yeah, so, um, this happened actually a few times in the history of physics, and uh, this is actually not a good, um, well, this, is, this doesn't reflect well on us physicists, that um, we physicists also believe what we, what we want to believe, and it's sometimes hard to conv convince physicists uh, of something new, even if it had been observed in experiment. So John Scott Russell actually built um, kind of a tank canal, a miniature canal in his backyard uh, and tried to reproduce it. And well, finally he succeeded and he was able to convince people when they saw it with their own eyes. But it took 61 years um, before, before theory actually came up with a solution. And this goes um, back to Kotevik and de Vries. You know, Kotevik, I think, was a, was a student of van der Waals, yeah, important um, figure in, in physics. And uh, Gustav de Vries, he was, he was a PhD student of, of Kotevik. When they created this, well, kind, it was a non, it's a nonlinear, yeah, so nonlinearity is the decisive thing, so a nonlinear differential equation, the Kordevik de Vries um, differential equation, and here you see a simulation. So a cosine, something that was initially a cosine, um, develops here in a train of, of solitons. Yeah, so other solution is something that you can, can observe um, at the swell, so the dünung in German, 
Um, yeah, so when, when a wave um, yeah, goes uh, uh, or arrives at a shallow coast, then you um, sometimes can see this peculiar shape, um, yeah, so this peculiar um, shape of waves where um, yeah, it's not a sign, as you see here. Yeah, it's too flat in the minima and too steep, too round uh, in the maxima. Um, these, um, yeah, so these waves actually, they, uh, they follow, um, they follow uh, the, um, yeah, so these are elliptical uh, functions of the Jacobi um, um, equations. And here you see a, um, a photo. Yeah, so actually airplanes of the US Army at the time in the 1930s or so. And you see all these, well, kind of, uh, well, they are not really solitary waves here, but uh, if the wavelengths here would go to infinity, so if these distances would go to infinity, there would be a solution to the, um, then these would be solitons, actually. Okay, here another uh, photo of the same phenomenon where you see that these waves, um, yeah, so they come here from different directions against the coast, and you see that they, um, yeah, so that they overlap, but um, they don't disturb each other really. Yeah, so they just uh, behave kind of like, well, particles. Um, yeah. Okay, well, so this is the Cordevec de Vries uh, equation, and it describes these water waves. By the way, it also describes um, tsunamis. So tsunamis can be seen as, um, um, as an approximation to a solitary wave. Another um, historically very important discovery that actually can be described in its continuous limit um, is the Fermi pasta ulam zingon experiments. Yeah, so Fermi, everybody knows uh, in physics, yeah, and uh, pasta. He was a uh, he was a uh, He was a physicist and a computer scientist, and ulam uh, was also um, 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 a mathematician. And uh, zingon. Well, I'll explain in a minute because this is the interesting person. Uh, so to say here. Um, so these three men here, Femi, Pasta, and Ulam, they were sitting together um, and they had a new toy, namely one of the first computers, the Maniac in Los Alamos, yeah, so connected to the nuclear weapons program. So this was in 1954. Uh, 50, uh, and you know, um, well, uh, of course, nuclear weapons development was still a pressing thing, but perhaps not as pressing as during the Second World War. And so they also thought about using the computer for something new. And um, what they decided to do was to, to, look, at a, um, to look at a string and um, actually to couple the different elements of the string in a nonlinear way and then to excite the string and just see how it behaves. Yeah, so these were these three men here. Um, well, and there was a surprise. Yeah, so here you see an animation of that. Yeah, so they couple it non uh, in a nonlinear way, and therefore you see that also the harmonics here disappear. Right? So different modes here uh, appear. And then if you let it, yeah, if you let it evolve, then the expectation was, of course, that, um, well, that the different modes, um, that the energy is, is distributed perhaps evenly or so uh, in the different modes. But what you observe actually is um, that these different modes, so these, uh, the harmonics here, that eventually, they go back to more or less, uh, they go back to zero, so that the entire motion is only in the first mode. Uh, I'm not sure whether, so it's probably, 
Um, yeah? So this was very uh, surprising. Yeah? And uh, now to the T here in this experiment, to the T. This was, this was Mary Tsingu, um, Mary Tsingu. And uh, she was hired by, by that, yeah, by the, by the lab as, um, as, a, as a human computer initially, right? And she was told right away that she wouldn't be paid as well as, as males, as her male colleagues. But there weren't many male colleagues because they were all drafted to the Korea War. Um, and they um, told her, yeah, so women are just, well, supplementary. Yeah, so they, they, they were very unfriendly in some way. But she was nevertheless happy because the job still paid very well. And so she programmed the entire thing, um, but she was not uh, a co-author, uh, also she did most of the work actually. Um, and the only note in that paper, which actually Fermi even dismissed as a minor result, um, yeah, so she just made it to a footnote. We thank Miss Mary Tsingu for efficient coding of the problems and for running the computation on the Los Alamos Maniac machine. Yeah, so she was actually running it probably a little bit too long. Yeah, so everybody has expected that uh, the initial perturbation dissipates to the other modes and uh, then it wouldn't be worse to spend more computer time, which was very expensive at the time, as you can imagine. Um, but probably she was the one uh, who discovered the uh, effect. Yeah? And here you see um, these uh, yeah, were mostly females who programmed uh, these computers. And this is the code, yeah? so it's still uh, existing and uh, Mary Tsingu uh, actually is still alive. Um, and yeah, so you can, can use, uh, you can look at some of the references uh, that I have, uh, yeah, so you see it in the left lower corner. Actually, there was also a feature, so this is actually from a feature in Physics Today, today from 2008 or so. Yeah, maybe I, if I don't forget it, uh, then I put it on, uh, on Moodle. Okay, so this was the um, Fermi Pasta Ulam Zingu experiment was one of the first simulations, actually. And uh, just from this fact, uh, very, um, very important. Yeah, they called it an experiment. It was, a, it was kind of a computer experiment. And of course, it was a nonlinear problem led to the, well, not discovery, but uh, uh, people realized how important uh, solitons can be in physics. Actually, solitons are quite, um, well, I wouldn't say ubiquitous, uh, but uh, not so rare. So for example, um, also the Einstein equations, yeah, so they are inherently nonlinear, and uh, in special cases, um, they are, um, solitons are actually a solution. And by the way, some of my colleagues here yeah, so Meinl is uh, still active, Neugebauer has retired, uh, Steudel uh, also. Right, so they actually wrote a book on solitons. Yeah, so um, all three um, scientists in the field of relativity. Next, um, the next uh, nonlinear equation, this is actually uh, called the Sine-Gordon equation. Well, uh, the name is actually a pun on, on the Klein-Gordon equation, which, as you probably know, is also um, an equation relevant for relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, so in, in the Klein-Gordon equation, you would have here m squared phi. Um, and well, here, the m squared is replaced by the sine, and so people call it just um, as a joke, uh, they call it uh, uh, sine Gordon equation. Um, yeah, and it plays a role in plasma physics and in, and in superconduction for Josephson contacts, for example. Yeah, uh, and um, it can be realized in a very 
in a very nice way. Um, if you take um, coupled pendulums, yeah, so here you see these screws, um, yeah, screw bolts, um, and uh, they are aligned here on the string and coupled by, by spring forces. And now what you could do is to throw a few of them, yeah, so to flip them quickly over, such that this perturbation would then, uh, would then travel along uh, this, this string. All right, so we also have an experiment in our, um, in our collection here. Um, and uh, then you can actually observe solitons. And um, here uh, there's an animation that I found somewhere on the internet. Uh, the reference I forgot, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, so you see another um, thing here, or once again, uh, this thing, that these two solitons, that they, yeah, they collide, but they just continue to travel uh, as if nothing would have happened. Also, the phenomenon is not linear. Yeah? So uh, similar thing here, um, again from some um, reference, so from Physical Review Eve, so fairly new actually. Um, um, this is of course um, described by the Cordivic de Vries equation, whereas the thing that I uh, have shown before is described by the Klein Gordon, uh, Sign Gordon equation, I'm sorry. Well, now, um, to optics. Yeah, so in optics, we need an, uh, an equation that admits a carrier, so, an, um, yeah, so the fast oscillation, the optical oscillation, and an envelope. We are talking about pulses. Yeah? And then we have to have an envelope, the pulse envelope, the amplitude, um, and in addition, we have to have the fast oscillation um, under this envelope. So, and um, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that we derived is able to do that, yeah, and we'll show that solitons are actually a solution of that uh, equation. So, um, so this was the standard form, and you might remember that here this P, this, um, oh yeah, here actually we, we have it once again. Yeah, so this, this P, I um, abbreviate, the, um, the dispersion. Yeah, so we have here the dispersion lengths, which is a um, um, yeah, so linear pulse dispersion. So if you send a short pulse through some dispersive medium, then it typically gets longer. And uh, this is described by this term here. Right? And here we have the nonlinear lengths. Yeah, so the Q here refers um, to the to the nonlinear lengths, whereas P uh, refers to the dispersion lengths. Um, so remember, uh, by definition, we said that the nonlinear lengths and the dispersion lengths is positive. Um, we said that, uh, of course, we know that dispersion can be positive and negative, um, depending on um, in which uh, at which frequency, at which wavelengths you are. Um, typically, for the optical regime, it is positive. Um, but we'll see that what we need here is actually a negative um, um, thing here. So uh, one needs to choose a wavelength where this is negative, or, well, one needs to use a few other tricks. Um, the nonlinear length is pretty much all the time positive, as we have seen, because the N2, the nonlinear refractive index, is positive. Yeah? So, um, yeah, so here, uh, all of that, yeah, it's just as a reminder, a few of these relationships. Um, we can ex uh, um, compare, so just for, as a side remark, we compare can compare this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation to the so-called cross petayevsky equation, which plays an important role in Bose-Einstein uh, condensation. Yeah, so you see, we basically have here um, this additional term. Now, um, for the optical solitons, it took actually until 1973 that 
uh, Akira Hasegawa, working at the Bell Labs, predicted that um, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation might have solitons as a solution. Um, actually, um, Hasegawa was not really, well, here I have him. Um, he, he's a plasma physicist. Um, working on tokamaks, yeah, so fusion energy, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, so the solitons, the optical solitons, this was more or less a well, side product of his work, I guess. Yeah? And then these uh, three persons, they conspired to discover the, the solitons. Yeah? So two experimentalists, and here you see Gordon, um, quite important figure. Gordon. Yeah, so together with um, Charles Towns, he was um, the co-inventor of the Maser. He didn't get the Nobel Prize for that. Yeah, so Towns uh, was not happy about that. Um, and uh, actually, already in the 60s, he, um, he was discussing about quantum information theory. Right, so there's Shannon's theorem for, for information theory. And um, he, um, he does discussed whether uh, quantum mechanics would, go, uh, would allow to go beyond that. So quite important uh, person, uh, although not very well known. Yeah. And finally, um, seven years after the prediction by Hasegawa, they had, they had it. Yeah. So they did an experiment. Now, this paper reports narrowing and splitting f uh, seven picosecond duration pulses from a mode locked color center laser by a 700 meter long uh, single mode silica glass fiber. At a wavelength at 1.55 micrometers, this is actually where the dispersion is negative, where second order dispersion is negative. Yeah? And uh, here are a few figures of that. Yeah? Um, and what you see are some characteristic uh, things, namely that the pulse width, the soliton width, the duration of the soliton gets narrower and narrower the f higher you make the intensity. Well, kind of, yeah, so what, what happens if you make the intensity higher? Then you produce um, a higher nonlinear refractive index and then uh, the chirp induced by by uh, by cell phase modulation, yeah, so the thing that we discussed in the last lecture, uh, gets stronger. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, of course, people had great hopes with solitons, namely that one use, uh, would use this for telecommunications. Uh, one can do that, but it's very, very complicated. Um, the problem is actually um, the problem is actually that um, that there are a few competing effects. Um, I think House, um, Gordon House, or so. Um, they uh, they discovered that there is a particular, yeah, or characteristic chitter um, that. Um, has to be suppressed, and this is uh, this is quite difficult. To my knowledge, solitons are not broadly used in telecommunications to the present day. Good. Um, now, before we solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, um, yeah, solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Before we actually look for conditions where the nonlinear Schrodinger equation has solitons as a solution. Yeah, so the nonlinear Schrodinger equation admits a, uh, admits a lot of solutions, but uh, what we are going to do is to look for the for the soliton solution. Before we do that, an elementary approach. Yeah, and here um, a figure that I have stolen somewhere. I don't remember where. Otherwise, I would give the reference. Um, so what you see here is a pictorial or a, um, or a cartoon of a soliton. Yeah? So uh, consider a street that's made of rubber so that a heavy car can actually depress it. 
right? And then um, if you have this group of vehicles, so a race car and a bicycle, uh, then the bicycle trailing the heavy car as, well, even without the wind shadow, it has an advantage, namely uh, the bicycle always goes downhill. Whereas for the race car, the opposite happens. Yeah? And um, this situation where the faster components have to go, have to go all the time uphill, whereas the slower parts of the wave packet um, go downhill all the time, uh, this keeps this, well, this unequal group of, yeah, of members here together. Okay, so just as a cartoon, uh, but now let's get a little bit more quantitative. Um, it is clear that, um, or it should be clear from the last lecture actually, that a necessary condition for the creation of a soliton is that the chirp due to second order dispersion, so due to, due, yeah, so described by the dispersion lengths, and the chirp due to cell phase modulation, that they have to cancel each other. Otherwise, it is not conceivable that you have a propagating disturbance that doesn't change its shape um, but propagates basically forever. Okay, so this is the condition, yeah, so that uh, both chirps should be equal in magnitude, but of course opposite in sign. Um, and, well, the only thing that we need to do is to look up the formulas for cell phase modulation, yeah, so the one that we derived last time. Yeah, so we found that the chirp parameter induced or created by cell phase modulation is given by this expression. Once again, um, of course, we have the intensity and we have the nonlinear refractive index. So this is the change in refractive index due to the nonlinear effect. What else do we have? We have the pulse duration, or rather, the inverse of the square of the pulse duration. Yeah, so this A naught. And, well, uh, in short, you can describe it as this one here. Now, um, linear dispersion, second order dispersion. So we have this K double prime. So you remember what we do is that we make a power series expansion of K of omega. And then the second order term, yeah, so this is the coefficient, this is this thing here. Yeah, again, you see here the square of A naught. Well, here it's just A naught. And um, then we demand that both are equal. Yeah, so, and you see uh, this here, one A naught cancels. Yeah, also Z cancels, which is the propagation distance. Yeah, which is a good thing. Yeah, so if Z wouldn't cancel, then uh, it would not be conceivable that you have um, a soliton that by definition keeps its shape as it propagates as Z increases. Well, and if we do that, um, then we get what's called the soliton condition. Yeah? And this is actually called the phase um, uh, or the phase version of that, yeah, because uh, we have here, um, um, yeah, so because of this term here. Um, we can also um, reformulate it a little bit by um, converting the A naught to the pulse duration. Yeah? So this is the pulse duration, tau squared uh, equal to one over A naught. And if we do so, then we get uh, what's called the solid, the area soliton condition because what we have here is the E field, so the amplitude of the pulse times its width, yeah, so which is proportional to the area of the pulse, yeah, so the area under the pulse. And uh, then this here would be the condition. Yeah, so easy enough. Um, but now let's try to find the same thing um, 
Ah, yeah, okay, um, as you might have expected. Yeah? So the same can be described, yeah? so, um, demanding that the dispersion links and the nonlinear links are the same, um, of course. Okay, now let's look at the, um, at the Schrodinger equation, at the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So here we have it. Yeah, so in um, the form uh, that I have presented already, yeah, it is formally uh, analogous to the, to the Schrodinger equation, but uh, actually only if P is larger than zero. Right? So if P is smaller than zero, we would have a positive uh, term here. Now, let's see whether this is fulfilled with our nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So here we have it. Yeah? And um, yeah, so we see, uh, so we can define here or we can identify uh, P with the sign of K double prime divided by the um, dispersion lengths. Yeah? And uh, here we have Q. Um, and, well, uh, by definition, LD and LN, they are positive. Yeah? So we can change the sign here by uh, the signum here, right? Whereas um, Q will always be negative yeah? because of this minus sign and because N2 uh, in virtually all cases is, uh, is positive. So what we see is that P has the same sign as K double prime. Yeah? And uh, what we saw uh, in chapter 14, as I said already, is that cell phase modulation produces a positive chirp. So K double prime has to be negative. We said this already, right? So, and this means that it seems that this, um, that this equation here can't be a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Well, let's try to fix that problem. As we'll see, actually, there's a fairly trivial thing here. Okay, well, if P is smaller than zero, then we just multiply our nonlinear Schrodinger equation here with minus one. Well, this gives, of course, the problem that here on the other side, on the left-hand side, will have the negative sign, yeah, so the wrong sign, so to say. Um, but actually, what we can do is to use a little trick, namely, just to take the complex conjugate of the equation. So what we are doing is to solve the complex conjugate of that equation. But that's good enough, actually. Right? Because if we know the solution of the complex conjugate, then we, of course, also knew, uh, know the solution of the original equation. So the complex conjugate of that equation is a proper nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and we solve that. and. Um, so we can assume without loss of generality that P is larger than zero. Yeah. So uh, here once again, the term for the potential, yeah, so this is typical potential term, uh, depends on, on psi. And this makes this partial differential equation nonlinear, thus the name. And what you also can see is that if Q is larger than zero, then the wave function digs its own potential, right? And then, yeah, so you need a negative potential in order to have a localized solution, right? And um, so if Q is larger than zero, then um, the solution of this differential equation can be, can be localized. Yeah. And this gives rise to effects that we already studied, namely self-focusing and self-trapping. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we discussed this last time. Yeah. But now, uh, and this is a difference here, now we have both things, namely the um, yeah, so in the, uh, in the previous lecture, we had the case where we have only um, 
Yeah, so where we essentially uh, could neglect this term here. And in chapter 14, we were actually neglecting this term. Yeah? And now we have both. Okay, now we look for a solution of this nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but I propose that we, that we do a little bit of, uh, of a break, so five minutes or so, and then we start to, to look at the, at the solution of this, um, of this problem. Yeah, to try to find a solution for, for this problem. I hope you have tea prepared or something. Um, hmm. Good. See you.
So here we are again, um, and now we really start to, to, uh, to uh, in order to, so we start to find a, a solution of that, of that problem. Yeah, so the soliton solution. So um, let's have a look here. The soliton solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, perhaps I should mention before that there is um, well, a much more powerful way to, um, to solve such problems um, called inverse scattering theory. Um, but we'll take the conventional approach, namely by making an educated guess an ansatz. And, so, and the ansatz is actually quite uh, straightforward. So what we do actually is, that we say that uh, that we yeah so that we yeah so that we use what we actually said from the beginning. Remember, we said uh, that in the optical domain we need uh, an envelope. After all, we want to describe a pulse, and we need the fast oscillation below that envelope. Right, and this is just what we write here. Yeah, so here is an envelope that propagates in space and time. And here is the respective phase. Yeah? OK, well, um, what do we do with an ansatz? So of course, we plug it into the differential equation. So here in our, in our nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And in order to do that, we go step by step. So we calculate, say, the derivative of this here, yeah? so the, spatial, uh, the temporal derivative of this ansatz. Yeah, so once the product rule, and we multiply it at the end with, with i, such that we have the same expression here. Right? Um, then we need the second derivative here. So the first derivative uh, here, and then the second derivative. Well, it gets a little bit lengthy, because you need the product rule twice. Yeah? But what I did here. Um, already is to, um, is to underline in different colors, in green, the real part, so what's, uh, what's real. Yeah, so this thing here, after multiplying with i, will be real, whereas this here will be imaginary. And I did the same here. Yeah, so all the things that are imaginary are underlined in red, and the rest in green. All right, and what it means is, yeah, so if um, this is the solution of, a, of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, then of course it must be a solution for the real part and for the imaginary part separately. So we simplified things yeah, by, by creating two equations instead of one. Yeah? Whether you see this as a simplification, well, anyway. Yeah, so these are the two equations here. And you see uh, which term is which. Yeah, so uh, very uh, transparent here. So the next thing is that we make more ansätze. Yeah, this is the German plural of ansatz, ansätze. Um, and we do it now for the amplitude, which is this phi, and for the phase. Yeah, so we write an ansatz. Um, and the question is, of course, uh, what kind of ansatz should we, should we, should we do? Um, and what you see here is actually that I make a wave ansatz. Yeah, so this is the characteristic argument of a wave. right? So in both cases, we have the characteristic um, argument of a wave. So remember, if you have a wave equation, say the standard wave equation where you have the second derivative of the spatial coordinate and the second derivative of the temporal coordinate, then um, people typically say uh, that the solution is a sign-like thing. Well, this is not very accurate in two respects, actually. Um, actually, every function that you can, for which you can 
uh, take the second derivative, and which has this argument here, is a solution of the wave equation. Yeah? So a wave, yeah, so people think about a wave of something that oscillates sine light. No, no, a wave is much more general. A wave is a disturbance that propagates in space and in time. Right? And once again, every function for which you can write down the second derivative, so which is smooth enough for physicists, actually, every function can be derived two times, right? So just a remark for mathematicians you know, that there might be other functions. Um, yeah, so every function that's relevant for physics um, and which has this argument here is a solution of a, of a wave equation. Well, and the soliton is actually a disturbance that propagates in space and time, so it's no wonder that we make such an ansatz. Yeah? What you see here is that we have two, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, so the argument in front, or the factor in front of the, of the temporal uh, variable, um, this, is, this is the phase, uh, this is the, 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 the velocity of this di disturbance. And uh, here it's, of course, the velocity of the envelope, and here it's the velocity of the phase. Right? And um, we use here two different velocities. Yeah? The first reason is, of course, that there's no reason to believe that they are the same, actually quite in the contrary, there's every reason to believe that they are different. Because you know, uh, from an elementary course in, in optics, that there is something like phase velocity and, and group velocity. Yeah? And the envelope is, is, of course, described by the group velocity. Good. So now we have unsets there. Yeah? And what we have to do is that we plug them into the differential equation, yeah? so which are now these equations here. So we do the same thing. We calculate the derivatives, and we plug them into the differential equation. So first in uh, the imaginary part, so in, uh, in this. Uh, equation 24. So um, these two, ah yeah, 27, yeah, so these equations in actually both equations here, right? And what we get is then this thing here, right? So uh, once again, you just plug in, well, these derivatives into uh, 23 and 24, and you get these two equations. But now we start with this equation 29. Yeah, we multiply it with phi, and then we integrate it. Yeah, so if you multiply it with phi, then you see that we have here phi and phi prime. Here we have phi squared, right? Uh, and here again, phi and phi prime. Right? So what you see is, uh, what we get is, yeah, so phi and phi prime, yeah, so if you take the derivative of phi squared, then you get exactly this uh, if you use the chain rule, right? So this uh, you see here, and um, so my mouse doesn't work any longer. This is not nice. I'm afraid I have to restart the computer. So the mouse, this mouse here still works. I hate it. Hmm. Not sure what the problem is. Maybe the battery is exhausted. So let's see. Oh yeah, okay, at least the mouse works. Uh, don't have this fake laser. 
but I still have a mouse. That should be, should be good enough. Okay. So now we have this differential equation, yeah? and uh, now uh, one of the tricks comes, namely, um, well, this differential equation has different types of solutions, but actually we look only for this for a special solution, namely um, for a localized solution for a soliton, which is a, a soliton is a localized solution, meaning that if you go far away from the maximum of the soliton then the envelope should be equal to zero, right? And um, yeah, so this means that the amplitude phi, right? So remember, we said that this wave function is, uh, we made the ansatz that it's amplitude times phase. And the amplitude got the name phi, so amplitude phi and the phase was theta. Yeah, so uh, it has to go to, uh, to zero if we go to infinity, right? And um, the conclusion is that then this, if we look for such solutions, then the integration variable uh, must be equal to zero. Yeah? Okay, if this is the case, then we can simplify this equation um, because we can divide through phi squared. Well, and we know that phi is not equal to zero because it's the amplitude. If it would be zero, it would be trivial. Yeah. Okay, then uh, what we have finally is, uh, is this equation here. So we have, um, well, a differential equation, a very simple differential equation for, for the phase. Yeah, so we were able to divide, to kick out the amplitude in this way, yeah, a trivial way to decouple these differential equations, right? And if we integrate it, then we get this thing here, right? So you expect, of course, uh, this argument, which I abbreviated uh, also by, by y. Okay, so what we can do here is, um, is to choose uh, the time origin such that this integration variable is equal to zero. Right, so see this immediately. Um, yeah, so by changing here or by changing here the, um, the origin of the time, uh, you can kill this argument here or this factor or this term here. Good. Um, well, if we have if we have solved one of these um, two differential equations, so if we know the solution for the phase, then it's probably much easier to find also a solution for the amplitude, right? So we plug in um, our solution in the other differential equations. So here you see them, yeah? So uh, this one we solved, right? And now we use this one here, but we plug in our solution that we have found. Right. So um, this is done here, right? And um, well, um, then I integrate, right? Similar thing as before, yeah. So similar trick as before, yeah. So you see here the first derivative and the second derivative. So this means that um, if I take the derivative um, of the um, of uh, phi, um, phi y squared, um, then I get this product here, right? So in this you see, yeah, so I integrate here and I get this term here, yeah? Phi y squared, the derivative of that gives this here. Well, and the rest is pretty straightforward. Yeah, so here the same thing actually, same trick. Um, and yeah, looks complicated, but if you have a closer look, uh, then it's actually not, uh, not so complicated. Yeah? Um, so it's, it's interesting to see here the square of the derivative of some variable, and uh, you have here the variable squared itself, right? And, um, 
Yeah? So in some sense, you, what you, well, you, we also have uh, this term. So uh, anyway, um, what you could, um, yeah, so if you would uh, it identify phi with the derivative, the temporal derivative of x, yeah, then you would have x dot squared, so the velocity squared. Yeah, so then this would look like a kinetic energy. And um, then you could be tempted to say, well, this here is the potential term. Yeah, then it looks kind of like energy conservation. Yeah, so what you basically say is kinetic energy and here potential energy. Uh, little bit complicated form, but never mind. Yeah, and this is actually this is actually written here. Yeah, it looks a little bit like one half mv squared plus some potential is equal to well. Actually, we can discuss that this should be equal to zero if we want to find a localized solution. Yeah, so again, if um, y goes to infinity, then this should be equal to zero. Okay, yeah, um, localized solution, but there's another condition than this one here. Namely, if we want to have a localized solution, then of course this potential term needs to be negative. Yeah? And I think this is what's discussed next, and I think the discussion, yeah, when I looked at it <coughs> yesterday, I wasn't very happy with the way I discussed it here. Um, so what we want to show is um, that this term here is larger than zero. And in order to show that, um, I go um, back to the, um, yeah, so I go quickly to the iPad here. Yeah. So this should be fine now. So what we can write, um, yeah, so introducing um, or abbreviating some of these um, yeah, long factors here. Um, so what I could write here, um, I could write uh, V effective as in this way. Yeah, so what we want to, uh, it is clear that uh, the effective potential should for a localized uh, solution should be uh, smaller than zero. And you, you see that um, instead of P times Q divided by four, I wrote just A and instead of, well, um, this complicated uh, expression here, uh, UE squared minus two um, UE times UP, um, I just wrote uh, divided by eight, I just wrote B, all right? So um, if we have this here, um, then we can, of course, divide through phi squared, right? So which means that a phi squared is, should be smaller than b, right? And um, this then means that b is larger than zero because um, we said that P and Q are larger than zero, right? So, and therefore we know what's actually written on the um, uh, keynote slide, um, that UE um, squared minus two times UE UP is larger or equal to zero, right? Because this here is this expression, yeah, so this is basically B, well, uh, perhaps divided by eight or so, yeah? Okay, so we quickly um, proved that this here is actually true. Yeah, so, um, what we have here looks kind of, um, um, of of energy conservation in mechanics, right? It describes the motion of some pseudo particle 
Uh, the soliton is now this pseudo particle in some sense. Um, um, and uh, what we have here, what is this here? Yeah. Um, well, what we also see is, of course, uh, what we already expected, namely that the uh, velocity of the envelope and the velocity of the phase, that they are, that they are different. Good. Doesn't work. That's annoying here. Ah, okay, yeah. So now, now what you see here uh, is that I plot here um, this pseudo potential, right? We have already seen that p q is larger than zero, right? So we discussed this, yeah, starting from the beginning. Yeah, so our pseudo potential looks like that. Right? And you see that here in this branch, I can find a localized solution. Yeah? If PQ P, uh, times Q is, is larger than zero. Right? And uh, here you have the turning points. Yeah? So in mechanics, it would be the turning points here, one and two. And um, yeah. Um, and it starts here at this phi equal to, um, to zero, right? And here we have again phi equal to zero, right? And uh, these, uh, you can quickly calculate this point, of course, yeah? Okay, so this equation, yeah? So this equation here can easily be integrated. Yeah, so this one here. And um, what you find then uh, is, um, is the secant hyperbolicus for the amplitude. Yeah, so for the amplitude, you find um, the secant hyperbolicus, uh, which is kind of, a, on first glance, it looks like, like a Gaussian. But if you look at it logarithmically, uh, then you would find yeah, whereas the Gaussian looks like a parabola on a logarithmic scale, this has um, wings that go down linearly. So, and if we take everything together, um, then we have, um, then this would be our, um, our solution. Yeah, so, we have the envelope, the second hyperbolicus. This is what we just found. And before we found the phase, um, yeah, this was on the previous page. Uh, we found the phase theta, um, exponential times theta, right? So this was this equation um, that we had on the previous page, right? And yeah, we're done, yeah? So here it is, yeah? And what you would find is that it, yeah, that it satisfies all the um, conditions uh, or, or the characteristics um, that we have seen. Yeah, so if you increase the amplitude, then the pulse duration shrinks. Yeah, so this was what we called the area condition. Um, this can be found um, as, a, as a consequence of this equation. However, if you make the, the power too, too large, um, then actually uh, the pulse would break apart and you would have two pulses um, in, um, as a solution. Um, let me um, just give one example of these solitons that are very relevant for, yeah, for modern nonlinear optics. And I sketch a little, a, a few things on, on my iPad in order to, to do that. So what we want to look at is, um, is, a, is a femtosecond laser. Yeah? So in the femtosecond laser nowadays, um, 
looks typically like this. Yeah, so you have a mirror, actually two mirrors, focusing mirrors, and um, there you have the amplifying medium, so uh, typically or quite often a titanium sapphire crystal. Yeah, so this is, um, this is corund, so aluminum 203, doped with, with titanium. Um, and this is pumped, yeah, say, by, by a green laser. No, I said a green laser. So something like this. Right? And now what you do is um, that you put a few other mirrors. Yeah, in the simplest case, just two other mirrors. So say such a mirror and, uh, and this mirror here. Uh, and then what you can do is to, uh, and then uh, ideally you have a laser. No, this doesn't make sense here. Like this here. Um, uh, so it would look like that. Um, and uh, this here could be the output coupler here. So um, if it transmits, say, 5% or so, then a laser beam would come out here. Right? So what does it have to do with uh, what we dis just discussed? Well, the following. Um, if we have short pulses, so in the case we have short pulses, then yeah, so if the pulse is short for a given pulse energy, then of course the intensity is high. Then as this pulse goes through this crystal, we produce self-phase modulation. Yeah, so we, own, uh, we already have half of what we, we were dealing with in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So now the question is that we need negative dispersion. Unfortunately, at the typical wavelengths um, of 800 nanometers of such a laser, uh, 800 nanometers, the material through which this laser goes has positive dispersion. Uh, so without further things, so without further measures, this would not, so this thing here, uh, yeah, so this laser here, would lace, no question, but it wouldn't produce short pulses, not to speak of femtosecond, lace, uh, of femtosecond pulses. So you have, to, you have to produce negative dispersion. And in the simplest way, the, the simplest thing that you could, can do is to coat these mirrors in a very special way. Yeah? To coat these mirrors such that um, that the different parts of the spectrum of this laser, that they penetrate to a different depth, yeah? so that the blue wings are reflected closer to the surface and the red parts that they penetrate um, a little bit. Yeah? Then the red parts are a little bit delayed. Yeah? In this case, uh, in this sense, you can produce negative dispersion. Yeah, so the, uh, there are other means to do it. Right? So this is already the modern way to do it. The other way to do it is to, is to use a pair of prisms. Yeah, so like this here. Um, like this here, right? And now if you send a laser Beam, ah, that doesn't make sense. Ah. So, like this here, through it, right? Then you can um, then this also produces negative dispersion. And actually, um, this kind of arrangement is particularly nice because by moving. Um, this prism in and out, 
you can um, adjust um, the dispersion balance. Yeah, so the separation of these uh, two prisms, together with their material properties, of course, together with their dispersion properties. Yeah, so the separation of these two prisms, this gives or this determines the amount of negative dispersion that you can realize. But now you can um, add positive dispersion by moving this prism um, more into the beam because then there's more glass. And if the glass has positive dispersion, which at 800 nanometer it usually has, so in this way you can adjust the dispersion. Right? So now you see that we have actually, um, that we have fulfilled the conditions of soliton creation. It is, um, we fulfilled it, I have to admit, we fulfilled it in a discrete way, right? Um, we produce um, positive dispersion here, right, due to cell phase modulation and actually also due to uh, the dispersion, due to linear dispersion. Um, and in each round trip, we would produce negative dispersion on each reflection, right? Um, so positive and negative dispersion, they are now separated in, in space, yeah? so they don't act simultaneously, so we would have to change uh, this differential equation um, a little bit, yeah? but these pulses, they travel um, through this oscillator a lot of time. Okay, so now um, what we have learned on solitons applies, of course, also to this problem. Namely, if you increase the power, then you can actually shorten the pulse to a certain extent, admit, uh, admittedly only, because if you, um, if you um, increase it too much, then uh, you will have pairs of pulses traveling through this oscillator, this is uh, typically something that you don't want. Yeah, then uh, the entire thing gets, gets unstable. Yeah, so this is a, an application of, these, um, of what we have just learned. A very important application, actually. Yeah, so I would like to spend the final 10 minutes or so um, on introducing a little bit uh, what we are doing in, uh, in research. Yeah, so a little bit of, uh, would like to present a little bit of my uh, research. And uh, the first thing um, is actually, yeah, so actually a pretty obvious, um, uh, yeah, a realization or example of what we just discussed, namely, that a pulse, that a short pulse, consists of an envelope and, um, well, and what we call the carrier, so the optical oscillation. And now if you have very short pulses, you know, so a pulse that has a duration of just five femtoseconds or, or less, um, then you see um, that um, here the maximum of the field coincides with the maximum of the, of the envelope, or what can also happen is that, um, well, um, that if you let it propagate through a little bit of glass, right, um, then the phase velocity is different from the envelope, and you probably have just seen this here, right? So what can happen is that, um, yeah, so that the pulse changes in this characteristic way, right? And this is very important for, for utter second laser physics, because um, all the phenomena that we are interested in, they happen within one optical cycle. Yeah? So an optical cycle here has um, two and a half femtoseconds or so. Right? They ha uh, happen in a fraction of a cycle, and uh, therefore it's important to have sub-cycle resol uh, resolution, and therefore it's important to control the shape of the wave and you can control the shape of the wave by knowing <clears throat> the relative phase um, of the carrier with respect to the envelope. Yeah? Uh, this is called the carrier envelope phase or 
traditionally it's called the absolute phase. Yeah. And I was the first to, to be able to measure it, to detect it. And we did it in a, in a, very, well, in a very intuitive way. Yeah? So what you see here is that um, the field strength here in this direction, in positive direction, is larger than in negative direction. Right? And if we, are, if, if we use these pulses in order to, to ionize gases, um, then the ionization probability at this point is larger than in these two points. Right? And if we use, if we ionize rare gas atoms, say xenon or so, with an ionization threshold of 13 electron volts or so, where you need many photons to ionize um, uh, this gas, uh, then actually uh, the difference in ionization probability can be quite large. But actually, this is not even the most important thing of that. And so there's the entire field of strong field laser physics. You can say extreme nonlinear optics, and we'll offer a course on that in the next semester. Yeah, strong field laser physics and attosecond laser physics. Matthias Kübel and I together, we will um, offer this, this course. And there you will learn uh, this kind of nonlinear effects, extreme nonlinear effects. Yeah? And what we built in order to measure this phase is it's a simple apparatus. Yeah? So it's a vacuum apparatus with two electron detectors and um, the uh, polarization is, uh, is here in horizontal direction. And yeah, so that's not what I wanted to show. And then depending on the phase, more electrons go in one direction than in the other direction. Actually, it's more complicated. We actually look at uh, also the time of flight because there are characteristic effects that can be exploited to this end. OK. So um, other experiments that we do uh, in terms of um, strong field laser physics, um, they um, have to do with a very sophisticated yeah, apparatus. This is an um, yeah, eight meter long apparatus, also ultra high uh, vacuum. And we produce in an ion source, different ion sources, we produce all kinds of exotic material exotic but of fundamental importance, like, for example, H2 plus. Yeah, so hydrogen, the hydrogen molecule, it's the only molecule with just, just one electron and therefore accessible to theory. Or um, some recent work that uh, we did with this apparatus is helium H plus. Yeah, you might wonder, um, whether this molecule exists at all. Well, actually, it's even the most, it's even the oldest molecule in the universe. It was the first molecule that was created after the Big Bang. And why? Because it's the most stable molecule. But it's stable only as, as an ion. Once you neutralize it, it decays inst uh, uh, immediately. But if it is an ion, yeah, so H, uh, uh, helium H plus, then it's a very stable molecule. Um, and it has uh, yeah, fascinating properties. Uh, actually, in space, it was discovered only, well, a little bit more than a, than a year ago. Yeah, so people knew that it must be there. Uh, but it was nevertheless difficult to discover in space. And they discovered it with a, um, with a telescope on board of a jumbo jet. Um, it's the SOFIA mission. Um, yeah, and uh, among its remarkable properties, there is, for example, uh, the fact that it has a very high dipole moment. Yeah, so it's the most um, polar molecule uh, at all. And therefore, one can drive it directly with a laser field. Uh, and this is uh, some recent experiments that we did. Um, a second class of things that we are doing, completely different. 
um, but actually also kind of nonlinear optics. But now the nonlinear optics of the vacuum, yeah, so uh, sounds very exotic, uh, but um, here is uh, the scheme of the experiment. Um, you use a very strong laser field, say a petawatt laser, and you would focus it, and then you have to know that vacuum is not as empty as the name suggests. In vacuum, rather, there is a constant process of creating and annihilating electron-positron pairs. Yeah? So if you think about the um, energy time uncertainty, yeah, so you know um, electrons have a rest mass of half a mega electron volts. Yeah? Now an electron-positron pair have, of course, a rest mass of pretty much one elect uh, a mega electron volt. And now you can uh, use uh, this uncertainty relation. Yeah, so uh, if you say, um, for a short enough time, um, I may borrow an energy of one mega electron volt. I just have to return it before this, the corresponding time is over, right? So then delta E, which is now one mega electron volts, times delta T, this is the time for uh, which you can borrow uh, this uh, energy, should be smaller than the reduced Planck constant. And if you do the calculation, then you find a very short time. I think something on the order of 10 to the minus 21 seconds or so. You know, so fractions, not of attoseconds, but septoseconds or so. But for this short time, um, these particles yeah, exist in quotation marks. And now if they are there, and if I apply a very strong electric field, then, so to say, I can align them uh, so that uh, so the, the positrons are up and the electrons are down. Right? And then you can imagine that um, vacuum suddenly becomes unisotropic. It's no longer isotropic, but unisotropic, and therefore it can be bireferentiant. Well, and if we have something bireferentiant, then we can probe it if we put a cross polarizer. It turns out that one should do this um, at X-ray wavelengths because yeah, what you want to measure is a phase difference between the fast and the slow axis, right? And the smaller the, the wavelengths, the more sensitive things get, right? So we do it at X-rays. We built X-ray polarimeters and we built the best in the world, actually by far the best in the world. And these X-ray polarimeters, they are far better than any polarimeters than you can build in the visible regime. Um, and they are very simple. The only thing that you do is that you make a Bragg reflection by 90 degrees, yeah? so 45 degrees of incidence, such that the beam is deflected by 90 degrees. Yeah? And now, you know, uh, from the second semester, if you have scattering at 90 degrees, then the parallel component is suppressed. Yeah? And this is exactly what we do. Yeah? So if you look at uh, the situation here, um, yeah, so this could be a silicon crystal, and we cut a trench, a channel into it. Uh, therefore, these crystals are called channel cuts, channel cut crystals. Yeah? And you orient this cut such that a break reflection happens at, for a given wavelength, of course, at exactly 90 degrees. Right? And with this, you can uh, actually, yeah, so and, uh, if you take a second one here, rotate it by 90 degrees, then you can shut off the beam, right? You can, you know, so like two cross polarizers, gets entirely dark. And uh, actually, our polarizers are so perfect that we can even shut off completely 
an X-ray laser. Also, it has 10 to the 12 or so photons per shot. Yeah? And now, if you put something here in between, namely um, the petawatt pulse, then some photons might come through. Yeah? So the same that you would do in the optical regime, where you put some material that you put under stress. Well, and here we stress actually the vacuum by a strong laser. Right? And th then by detecting these photons, um, one can measure the nonlinearity of vacuum. OK, finally, um, something less exotic, but also very beautiful. We, um, we use XUV radiation that we generate by processes uh, that are typical for extreme nonlinear optics. Now, it's high harmonic generation. We were talking here in this lecture about second harmonic generation or third harmonic generation. Actually, if you use an intense laser pulse, then you can, um, then you can um, produce not only the, um, the second or third harmonic, um, rather, if you just focus an intense laser pulse, not as intense as a petawatt laser pulse, millijoule femtosecond pulses or so, uh, even less you can use. If you focus this just into gas, into diluted gas, um, then you won't get, of course, the second harmonic, yeah, because uh, just gas has, has inversion uh, symmetry. So you would get the third, the fifth, the, sec uh, the seventh, and uh, the ninth harmonic, and so on and so forth. Right, so if you would draw the spectrum, um, yeah, so, no. Uh, here the intensity of the harmonics and here the harmonic order, or you could also say the frequency, um, yeah, and we have the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the yeah, seventh harmonic, ninth harmonic, eleventh harmonic, and so on. Yeah, what you certainly expect is that the intensity of the harmonics goes down, yeah, even on a logarithmic scale. Yeah, if this. Thank you. Yeah, so we have the logarithmic intensity, the log of the intensity, yeah, and um, what you certainly expect is uh, so a little bit spoiled from, um, yeah, from quantum mechanics perturbation theory. What you certainly expect is that the intensity of these harmonics goes down, right? And this is actually what you observe. But uh, for high enough harmonics, their intensity remains more or less constant for an in extended frequency range, and if eventually it dies off. Right. And this is an effect, yeah, so one of the very typical effects in strong field laser physics. I discovered during my PhD the, yeah, the analogous effect for photoionization. Um, but harmonics, yeah, so XUV radiation is a very valuable. And these are harmonics, yeah, so this is coherent. So this was discovered in 1988 by Anne Lullier, now working in Sweden. Yeah, and I'm sure that at some point she will receive the Nobel Prize for, for that discovery. Um, so, and these harmonics uh, we use in order to do, um, to do imaging in the XUV. Yeah. And this is, actually, um, this is actually one example. So what we did here uh, is that we, um, that we uh, realized what's called coherence tomography. Yeah? Coherence tomography is, is known since 30 years or so in the optical regime. Um, and nowadays, actually, if you go to the ophthalmologists in order to have your retina um, examined, 
right? Uh, they have these OCT devices in, yeah, so um, better ophthalmologists have such a device. And what you can do is uh, that you can look at the depth structure of the retina. Yeah, so the retina has a layered structure and uh, this is a very pow powerful diagnostic tool. But we do the same thing, and the resolution that they have, um, yeah, so it's kind of a white light um, interferometric technique. Um, the broader the bandwidth, the higher the resolution, the depth resolution. Um, yeah, would be nice to give a short introduction uh, to that, but we don't have the time for it. Uh, you may want to, if, you, if you're interested, I can explain it tonight in our question and answers uh, session at five o'clock. Yeah, so I would like to invite you to that also. Um, yeah, so instead of doing in the optical regime, we use these high harmonics, which you saw have a very broad bandwidth, in order to look at the depth structure of solid state material. So what we did here, um, that we buried two layers of gold in silicon yeah, at a depth of 200 nanometers or 300 nanometers. And we even wrote a little bit stuff on it. Right? And uh, with this technique, we are easily able to, to resolve that. OK, I think we are done for, for this course. It, yeah, uh, it was not nice to have no students here. <laughs> But uh, I nevertheless enjoyed it somehow. Uh, I hope that you uh, also enjoyed it and perhaps you uh, attend the Zoom session tonight. Um, of course, there still will, uh, there will be the final at some point, um, I think 2nd of March or so, uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, I wish you all the best. Um, if you're interested in one of the topics that I have just shown, then let me know and we can discuss whether there is uh, a smaller research project or a larger research project, uh, perhaps even a master thesis for you um, in, these, in these fields. So thank you once again and I wish you all the best for the future. <laughs>